Dendrochronology comes from the term dendron, which means tree, chronos, which means time, and logos, which means the word or study of. So the definition of dendrochronology is the field of study that uses the annual growth ring of trees to establish dates. Now trees can't be determined by their height or their diameter because the height and the diameter can depend on how much water it's gotten, how much sunlight it's gotten, how much nutrients it's gotten, and so forth. So two trees of the same species, ICSI, in the same area can be greatly different in size and yet being the same age, depending on where they're on the mountain, how much rain they're getting, and so forth. So what's the best way to determine how old a tree is? Not by its diameter, not by its height, but by its what? tree rings. That's what dendrochronology is, using these annual growth rings to try to establish data. Now what causes tree rings? Trees vary in their growth rate. For example, in the spring, trees grow faster than they do after, say, the frost. They'll start quit growing now. They, in other words, the time they grow is spring and summertime. In the winter, it either stops or goes very, very slow. The contrast between these periods of rapid growth and slow growth, the contrast is what produces these rings. Normally, a new ring occurs every year and usually the tree rings extend around the entire circumference of the tree. There are times when you could possibly get more than one growth ring per year. For example, if you had a prematurely warm spring and then followed by a sudden cold spell, you could possibly get more than one ring. But in general, about one ring per year. I have a picture here of a typical cross-section of a tree. This is a Douglas fir. The inner ring on this sample has been dated to 1928. This is a relatively older picture. It was taken in 1965. Now tree ring dating is only possible in certain parts of the earth. You have to have seasons. So you will note a picture like this that you don't do tree ring dating along the equator. Normally, tree ring dating is done from 30 degrees north and south latitude, above 30 degrees latitude or below 30 degrees on the south. What I'm saying is that in order for a ring to form, you've got to have it stop growing and then grow, stop growing and grow, and that wouldn't happen in the Amazon. I don't have a good detail here, but there's a portion here of the ring where when the tree's growing, it's big, like maybe. Maybe it's light in color. And then in the wintertime, it slows down and you have a dark portion. And then you have a period of growth in the spring and then a period of non-growth. And that's what causes the rings. The growth occurs during spring and summer and doesn't occur or very slow in the winter. Where you get in a place later, you don't have that cold spell. So it's just going to continue to grow and you won't get the ring that you would get here. And some people have the idea that maybe there wasn't any rings at all before the flood. Okay. That maybe because of the uniform climate. So this is a map that shows where the tree ring dating is possible. I've mentioned to you that lots of factors affect the growth rate. This is a really interesting thing. If, but you can probably see those little growth rings here. And then after a fire, you see big growth rings. How could the fire increase the rate of growth of a tree? If it destroys the surrounding trees so that the tree can get more nutrients or sunlight, then this will cause the tree. On the other hand, if the fire attacks a tree, then it could kill or slow down. So a fire could either speed up or slow down. It will speed up if it affects the other trees, probably slow down if it burns itself. Now, how can we possibly count the tree rings? Easiest way is to take a tree that's cut down, use a chainsaw, and cut it up. Or, of course, a living tree. You could cut down the tree. And if you want to know how old that tree was, cut it down, count the ring. <laughs> Not everybody likes to have their trees cut down, though. 
So how do you date a living tree? You don't want to cut it down. They have what's called an increment bore. See the little tool in the guy's hand? This takes a little sample. It's a core that's about comparable to the size of a pencil. They take this core out. Can you see this little core that he's got here? You can see by the size of his finger approximately how big that sample is. And then you can take these things and lay them down and you can see the count the rings. Now you got to be careful on this increment bore because you don't want to, for example, put things back in there and disease the tree. So normally they just hook out the sample and leave it and let it try to heal itself. But I want to go back here because I think it's important. Do you see how short increment bore is? I mean, a little thin thing like that, you can't go in five, six feet. You can only go in maybe eight, ten inches. So really, they can't get all the way to the center. So what they have to do then is what they call cross-dating. We'll talk about that later to try to estimate the growth of a living tree. So it's not a real accurate method, but it beats cutting the tree down. Certainly you don't want to go into the Sequoia National Park and cut that tree down. Some of them, they don't even want you to drill samples in. Trees don't die of old age. What do they die from? Fires die from diseases and sometimes they'll die from insects like termites could live on and on and on and on. This particular tree that I'm showing you here is the General Sherman which is thought to be the largest tree in the world as far as volume. It's not the highest but it's one of the largest as far as volume is concerned. It's 274 feet high. That's still pretty high. That's almost the size of a football field. But the reason why it's such a big tree, the measurement around it is 102.6 feet. That's the equivalent of about 52,000 cubic feet of lumber. That's a lot of lumber. Here's another picture of a giant sequoia. They're beautiful, and I like trees. I like big trees. I like to go to some of these parks and see these giant California redwoods. Now, the oldest tree has been estimated at 4,900 years old. But, let me repeat, how far in does an increment borer go? Just 8 or 10 inches. Also, the bristlecone tree is not a beautiful tree, it's a snarly tree. It could come from several roots. So it's pretty difficult to estimate the age. Methuselah, the one that they claim is the oldest, they've been estimated 4,763 years. But if trees could live forever, could keep on living for a long time, why don't we find trees older than, say, 4,000, 4,500 years, that type of range? Well, what happened about 4,500 years ago? There was a flood. So the oldest tree is approximately the date of Noah's flood. I personally believe the great flood of Noah's day destroyed almost all the trees. That's where we get the coal from. We have huge coal formations. There must have been a lot of trees buried and destroyed. I say it flood destroyed most because the dove came back with a leaf on it. So there were some that survived, but I don't think very many. But the seeds could have floated and replanted themselves. And that's probably what happened. The trees reforested after the flood from seeds that were probably floating on the water. Seeds could survive flooding and probably replant it after the flood. Now the cross-dating technique I mentioned is that because the ring size varies a whole lot depending on the growth rate, they use what's called cross-dating and they take one sample of wood, try to match it with another sample of wood, try to match it with another sample of wood from one tree to another and they try to determine the age of trees. And some have even claimed that perhaps some trees were 8,000 years old. But again, I want to emphasize this was not arrived at by counting the tree rings of one living tree or one dead tree. Couldn't by the living tree because you can't get far enough in there with a the borer, but rather these type of ages have used 20 different trees. I have a problem with that 
because some dead for over 3,000 years, and I doubt whether tree samples would last 3,000 years with bacteria and decay and termites and so forth. If you take one sample and then compare it to another sample that's older, and another sample that's older, and another sample that's older, to get 8,000 years, you'd have to have one that was like maybe 5,000 years old, and it had been dead 3,000 years, probably even more than that, try to determine that type of thing. So it's not an accurate method. Termites decay. Uh, just in thought of this, the finding of Noah's Ark. I personally know John Morris, who is now the president of the Institute for Creation Research. He's made, I think, like 12 or 13 expeditions to Turkey. They're hoping to find the Ark. You know, if you found the Ark, it'd probably be the greatest archaeological discovery ever made. The only way it could possibly be preserved if it was frozen in ice, but otherwise if it wasn't, I don't see how wood could have lasted that many years. So I kind of question whether they ever will find the Ark. That's kind of off the subject. Okay, let's talk about this idea of 8,000-year-old trees. Why do evolutionists especially evolutionary dendrochronologists want to try to achieve older dates than the 4,000, 4,500 years. Well, I think part of it is they have an assumption that the Ice Age occurred 10,000 years ago, and so they want to push the dates back to 10,000 years if they could possibly do it. Also, I'm sorry to say, but if you stretch out the age things, some of them want to destroy any faith that people have in the Bible. So the older the things can be made to appear, the less reliable the Bible seems to be. The uniformitarian principle that is used a lot in scientific circles is that the present is a key to the past, that all things continue as they always were, that there never was a catastrophe, that you can explain everything that you see in terms of modern day effects and principles and changes. And that, of course, the uniformitarian principle would rule out a catastrophe like Noah's flood. I like this little poem here. It's called, Only God Can Make a Tree. I think I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree, a tree whose hungry mouth is pressed against earth's sweet flowing breast, a tree that looks at God all day and lifts her leafy arms to pray, a tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair, upon whose bosom snow has lain, who intimately lives with rain. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a 